Hey, what's up everyone? William Payne coming to you from Cupertino, California. Today is May 3rd, 2020. It's our 10th and final lesson of season four. Uh, thank you guys for coming in. Thanks for spending a little bit part of your Sunday. And uh, we got a great lesson planned for you. Today we're talking about how to learn new music. You know, it's uh, interesting in the last couple weeks, we're just, there's like a few things happening right now and a lot of my questions I've been getting from my students have been about learning new music. Uh, and today we're gonna talk about, you know, four examples uh, of how you can be applying some strategies to learning new music. I know that when I first started out, I thought learning new music just meant, you know, kind of like working your way through it, hacking through it, and then just doing it over and over and over again until you could play it. And uh, we're gonna talk about our 10 specific strategies that you can be using to learn music more efficiently, um, so that you're learning it correctly the first time around and able to get it up to those tempos that you're striving for, the performance tempos, um, and help you kind of just troubleshoot some of the problems that tend to arise when you're, when you're hacking through music. So um, today there is a free handout for the, uh, the lesson. It's right here. Uh, Instagram folks, hi, thanks for coming in. If you want, you can also check the stream out on Facebook and you, YouTube. That's where we're live right now as well. And you're going to be able to see all the music overlays. And you know, I've got, I've gotten a little bit better at these live streams with each lesson. It's our tenth one over the last two months. So um, you can check this out on Facebook or YouTube. You can also catch us on the uh, the replay afterwards as well. And uh, we're going to pop in and say hi to everyone in just a second. But you can pick up this free handout, slash free lessons on my website. You can also see all the handouts from the last nine weeks. So last week we did a targeted timing lesson. It was like a follow-up lesson to Carl's lesson, which is part of his eight-week drummer group, which is also happening on Facebook right now. He's in week two of that, but we did a lesson all about that and kind of the next steps. I know we've got a few friends coming in from eight-week drummer right now, uh, so you can pick up that handout. And then um, as you're coming in, just let us know where you're watching from. You know, these are so much about the drumming, but they're also about just kind of an international community. Friends are coming in from all over the place. So uh, it's fun if you share this out on your social channels. Do me a favor, just hit that share button uh, with uh, your Facebook or your YouTube account, social media, on Instagram. You can use that little airplane button at the bottom of the screen. And uh, of course, if you like the content, please hit like, follow, subscribe, share, all that good stuff so you can get more notifications, okay? So let's say hi to some folks as they're coming in. Uh, thanks everyone for your messages. Uh, music and stuff. 912 says, what time is it for you? It is 840 over here. So if you're on the East Coast, I know this is a, a late stream for you. Um, I usually do these earlier in the afternoon, like early evening, late afternoon. Uh, but today the weather was just so beautiful here in Cupertino that we took the kids out. And uh, so we're, we're doing a little bit later tonight. So uh, thanks for coming in. Hello from Brazil. Hi, thanks for coming in. Thanks guys. Instagram friends, hello. Nadnar Vivella, Vivella, hi guys. Di Min Young from Brazil, hello, hello. Uh, Hood, yes, awesome guys. All right, well let's get into it. And um, we're gonna pull up the handout here first. So I'm gonna try some new tech things. Let me get this camera focused over here. Some new tech things today. Um, let's get right into it. And I, I sort of tested this before we started, but not not a lot so we're we're gonna kind of learn as we go i'm gonna try this and then i'm gonna do that and then i'm gonna do this okay all right and we're gonna see why here in a second hi alice from honduras awesome guys this is like so exciting it always you know it blows me away just how many people are coming in from all over the place so thank you for tuning in I'm gonna do my best to make this a, a fun lesson for you guys, okay? So I'm trying a few new things today and the setup is a little bit different because one of the strategies is about writing and marking in your music. And so I've hopefully got this up to such that where we can do some markings today. But um, in this example, uh, I've got four examples for us today. Uh, the first one is a Mitchell Peters etude from his Intermediate Serendum Studies book. That's etude number 16, which is also the 2021 California all-state audition music, which I'll be doing a series of lessons on over as well. Uh, we're doing some uh, video lesson build-outs for our, our institution accounts for Drumline Chops. So this is one of those that we're doing for California this year. And then the second one is the first two lines from Portraits and Rhythm, which is AT number four, also for the California all-state music that's happening this year as well, and for another one of our institution accounts. So those two, and then 
Also, you may have heard about this already, but if you haven't, like virtual drum and bugle corps is happening right now. So for all the, the fans of drum, drum corps that uh, know that the summer uh, tour has been canceled, there's a virtual drum corps happening right now. And I've just pulled just a couple lines from the music, and I didn't get a chance to talk to, to Ben about this beforehand. So hopefully it's okay, Ben. But what we're going to talk about is how to learn this kind of music. So whether you're getting ready to audition somewhere, you're beginning ready to learn the Allstate music for next year. If you're getting ready to submit your audition video for Virtual Drum, Drum and Bugle Corps, uh, we're going to do a, a snippet from the A-class line and also a snippet from the world-class line. But when you see this, it's like... How do I even start learning this piece of music? Okay, and so I've got some strategies for us to go through today. And um, today, earlier, right before I got on, I saw uh, Kai Suchi had posted his snippet or a snippet of his audition music. He's already learned like the second half of the, the tune. Most people don't roll out of bed just going what are they and playing the part as well as Kyle does. So we're going to talk about you know if you're if you've just gotten the music, uh, let us know if you're doing this first of all, uh, virtual drum and beat core. And then, you know, what are some strategies that you use to start learning music, okay? So let's just jump into it. I'm gonna move through these first two pretty quick because we've only got about an hour and then I'm gonna kind of get to the, the second two because those are gonna be a little bit more meaty uh, than the first two, okay? So um, let's get into it. So the first thing, whenever you look at a piece of music, the first thing you're gonna wanna do is just kind of get a lay of the land, like get some context as to uh, what am I looking at? Okay, and I tell my students the first thing is you look at the title, you look at the composer, and you're kind of putting that into your musician library, your card catalog, so that the next time you see a piece by that composer, or if you see a title, it can give you some clues. You know, right now, this first one, Intermediate Snaredom Studies. So you go, okay, there's Intermediate, and then if you know Mitchell Peters' Snares books, Snare books, then you know he has a beginner snare book, an intermediate snare book, and an advanced snare book. Fun fact, when I was doing my own personal research on Mitchell Peters, he actually wrote Advanced Snare Drum Studies first, and it wasn't until many, many years later that he wrote Intermediate and then went back and wrote Beginner. So right out of the gate, he came swinging with, with uh, Advanced, and Intermediate is great, especially if you're like a high school player or a college player and you're just looking from sight, for some sight reading material. And a lot of time you hear people say like, oh, how do I get better at sight reading? You just have to practice and do it a lot. Intermediate is a great book for you to just you know read a little bit out of each day. It's also perfect for intermediate school or middle school students to play like some solid etudes because uh, there, there's some very defined musical phrases. You use a lot of uh, common rhythms that you might see. And um, I find that it makes good musical sense. Lots of buzz rolls in there so you can start working on those and doing these. So uh, my first tip is to look at the title, okay? Um, let's look at the other one as well. The, the next one is Portraits in Rhythm, etude number four. So you know that there's like 30 something, uh, or is it 40? I should know the answer to this. Is it 39? I forget how many etudes there are in portraits, but this is number four. It's written by Anthony Cerrone. Um, when he first came out with Portraits and Rhythm, you might have it. It's a, I don't have it with me, but it's like a copy of the uh, the red cover. It's a little bit thinner, and then uh, years later, he came out with like the blue compendium with the program notes and performance notes and, and practice tips. And also, if you go to uh, Mr. Cerrone's website, um, you can actually buy video lessons of him teaching these etudes. I remember when I first got to California and that these were being used, I actually bought a few of those video lessons because I've actually never had the, the, the fortune of studying with Anthony Cerrone, uh, but to get to hear him talk about why he wrote the etudes, um, how he went about constructing them, in addition to getting to read his, his program notes uh, was really, really cool. So you should check that out on his website as well if you haven't yet. And then we'll jump ahead to the next one. Obviously this says uh, Virtual Drum and Bugle Corps 2020, so that's for this coming year. It's written by Benjamin Piles. I actually don't know Ben personally, but we we like run in the same circles. Uh, he's written two. There's one for A class and there's one for world class. We're going to talk about both and how you can start about learning those. Okay. So regardless of what music you're learning, my first suggestion is just to read the title, get some context. In addition to the title and the composer, you're looking at the time signature, you're looking at the tempo, just so you kind of get a feel of what it's going to feel like. Because in a second, once you look at it, you're going to sight read it. That's the first thing you're going to do. And there's a couple things about sight reading. Um, you know, pick a tempo where you can not stop. I mean, the main thing is once you start, you can only start read a piece of music once, and then once you start, the key is to not stop. You've got to force yourself to keep going, you know, as if it's a performance. And that's how you get better at sight reading. So in this tempo, it's 108. So immediately in my head, I think, okay, 108. 120 is bum, bum, so a little bit slower. This may be about 108, right? Zzz, 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 bum, 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 digga, digga, dum. 
right? So now I have a tempo as to what the, the beat of the music is, and in my head, I'm gonna start scanning, okay? Before I start singing through it in my head as I go through it, the first thing I wanna do is just kinda of scan the music and see, is there anything that's weird that I don't recognize, okay? And this is where I'm gonna start trying to mark up the music here. So, uh, if, wait, work with me here. No. Butter, bing, boom, bong, bang, boom. Okay, so um, I'm gonna take this from a beginner's perspective. So I'm an intermediate school student, I'm scanning this and I see this first thing, like what does that mean? Um, for most of us, we know that that means a roll. Uh, in this case, you see three slashes, which technically, it can mean a couple things. Like if you were, it's like, if you see one note, it's double the note value, so it'd be quarter notes. If you see two slashes, it'd be double that, so it'd be eighth notes. And so if you see three slashes, it can mean, but in this instance, we know that it's, it's a buzz roll, right? Uh, so for a beginner, if you don't know that, what you're doing is you're scanning just the music in general, so like, what do I know and what do I not know? And if you see these symbols or uh, musical notations that you don't recognize, Anything that you don't see, uh, anything that you see that you don't recognize, you're gonna wanna take a moment and, and kind of just take stock of that. Be like, okay, I don't know what that is, so I'll either, either need to look it up or do something else when I get there. I'm just scanning for anything that's weird, okay? Um, for some students, this dotted rhythm might be a new rhythm for them. Three, a, uh, three, a, uh, four, and, right? And I'm scanning, 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 and then I notice that, okay, the dynamic changes to piano right there. This rhythm might be a little bit tricky for some people when they first start. Um, but as you're scanning, you're also starting to notice some of these patterns. Like you see the, that E and A, and the, this rhythm, by the way, is three E and A. Three and A, that happens once in the third bar, in the fourth bar, I'm scanning, uh, and I do another quick scan, it happens here, and it happens here. And you say, oh, so he's using E and A four, or E and A three, or E and A one as a rhythmic mo motive as it's coming back and forth, okay? So in my scan, I start to notice that if I figure out that that's, Eanda, when I see it later, then I don't really have to worry about that, right? Um, and then flams here might be something else for someone that, that's, a, that's, that's a, a challenge, right? If you don't know how to play flams or you don't play them as often. So you're also taking stock of like, what are the things that I'm gonna have to work on in order to play this etude as I keep going? Um, so now real quick for Instagram folks, if you're watching this right now and you're like, what is he looking at and what is he talking about? You can go over to Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash Pan, or you can go to YouTube, youtube.com slash Pan. It's also on Twitter, on Periscope as well. But uh, you can come on and, and see the music. Uh, you know, Maybe someday I'll have it set up to where there's a gigantic projector back here and you can see this on Instagram. But until they have these screen overlays, um, you can check it out on one of those other platforms. Thanks, Jason. Jason says, what are some ways to play faster? Oh, that's a great question, Jason. Um, there's actually a lesson from like two or three weeks ago, three or four weeks ago, chops, how to build chops. Uh, and you should check out that lesson because we did a whole video lesson about that. And um, the main thing is just to know your thresholds and, and bump through those. Okay, good question. Um, okay, so flams and then, oh, this is kind of cool. Let me show you guys a little bit behind the scenes thing. This here is one of the uh, things, uh, Dre, if you're catching this after fact, this is an idea from my buddy Dre. Um, you know, he mentions how a lot of times with his beginners, he's got to write out the hand speed or the subdivisions that beginning players are playing under the buzz rule. Like a lot of times when you play a buzz rule and you go for uh, an experienced player, you'd go one and two and three, four, one. And you'd probably play three and a four and a one or, right? But for a beginner, when they hear that, they just go, whoa, that's a lot of notes. Like, stop. And what I, uh, sometimes my beginners will go, and they'll just move their hands as fast as they can. You say, like, oh, no, 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 there's like a rhythm that you're playing underneath it. So one of the things that we're experimenting for our Drumline Chops Institution accounts is, is you know, creating those uh, educational notes for the students within the synchronized video and the notation, okay? All right, bigga digga dup, bigga digga dup. You see, this is like a, a very Mitchell Peters thing where he plays the same rhythm back to back, but he just places the beat. Uh, we talked about the eander already, and then we've got a roll, and then there's another eanda da, okay? So that's, that's kind of phase one, is just to do a quick scan, get it context, and then if I was gonna sight read this, then I would start singing through it in my head. I would, kind of my eyes gravitate to where there's the most black on the page, and I'm like, okay, that's probably the most difficult section, and we're gonna see this here in just a second. That's the most difficult section, so I need to kind of look at that section as I'm doing this. 
but then I'll just kind of start singing through it and hearing it in my head. So, bzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
check out that lesson. But he talked about just like reading as much as you as you can. And I remember I did that a lot in high school. I just read a bunch. But I also know that you know I think of my my friend Billy Spicer, who marched uh, Cavaliers before I marched. Billy marched in '99 and 2000, maybe, and he didn't march in 2001. I think those are right. Those two years, but. Uh, Billy tells the story of how like when he was in high school, he just had a gigantic, I think it was like a three inch binder, you know, and he would just fill it from cover to cover with licks. You know, Billy is notorious for knowing, you know, like 81 Madison scouts and 72 velvet Knights. you know, I don't know if those are actual years, but he knows licks from every drum corps from all these random years because he had this big binder and he said he would just play through this binder from top to bottom like every day, so he would just read, and he's like a mach like a reading machine, so you get familiar with these rhythms the more you do them, okay? Uh, regular expression, and then you can practice sight reading. So practicing is a skill, that's the most important thing you have to remember. Practicing is a skill, you can get better, better at it. It's not, I'm either good at it or I'm bad at it. You can get better at it the more you do it, okay? All right, um, a lot of talking in this first half, and we're gonna get to more playing here in just a moment, but these are kind of the, the things, that you, the strategies that you wanna use, and then we're gonna show you how to use them here in just a second, okay? All right, so the next step is this portrait and rhythm. Let's imagine that you've sight read it already, you're doing other things. Now you've got to learn it. And in this instance, um, it's going to be even more important here in just a second when we go to these, these drumline excerpts in just a moment. But if I was learning this, I'm a high school student now preparing, preparing for Allstate for next year, right? Um, I might say like, oh, I don't know what this, this thing is, right? This four-stroke rough or triplet rough to get a got. And there's a couple seconds that you can do. And then the question is like, can you do it consistently? I'm doing a right, left, left, right sticking here in this case. Let me just switch the concert six for a second. Right, you've gotta be able to do four, eight, 16 of them in a row. Yeah, you might have, to, you can play them alternating as well. Left, right, left, right. Right? You also just have to work that consistency. Um, fun little anecdote. Uh, this year, my middle school band director, uh, Mr. Greg Dick, who's been teaching at Friendswood High School for the last, uh, I don't even know now, 20 plus years, I would guess. But he's been teaching for 40 plus years and he's retiring this year. And um, he was the one that taught me how to play these four stroke roughs when I was in seventh grade because we had made Texas Allstate that year. And uh, for, for the Allstate Convention, one of the pieces we played was March the Belgian Paratrooper, Paratroopers. And when I got the notice that he was retiring this year, um, or heard that he was retiring this year, um, I, I like went back and listened to that piece of music. Because in the beginning of that piece, it started... Right? And you have to play a ton of these four stroke roughs in a row. And I remember him saying to me like, okay, wait, well, I'm giving you the, the four stroke rough part. You've got to master how to play these. I was like, wait, what, what am I doing? How do these go? And I played them open too. I was like. Right, so like little seventh grade Hui is in his bedroom going. Right, I'm already in like orchestral excerpt mode. And uh, man, I remember I nailed it for the, uh, the Allstate uh, performance. So uh, thanks again to Mr. Dick for, for teaching me those and, and then having me master them. So um, learn it under tempo. So you might have to learn this slower. And with this, with this, this opening two lines, not so much because these are kind of, this is like the, the overture, it's the opening statement. It's not super dense like you'll see in the next couple uh, excerpts that we're gonna look at, but Definitely what most what happens to most students is they see dotted chord note equals 56 or they say chord note equals 200 and they think that's the speed that they should be practicing it at. It's like, no, no, no. Don't be afraid to cut that tempo in half and go half the speed that you're learning because this is, I find, what separates a lot of like beginners from professionals, right? Professionals know how slowly they need to take it in order to learn it correctly and then speeding it up becomes... Uh, it comes very simply because you're investing more time up front learning it correctly and then when you start to speed it up your hands aren't confused because you've already programmed it, them to do all the right things your brain knows what to think about and what to notice you've already worked out all the details so that as you speed up it should be very um, painless uh, early on in my career I would learn things too fast 
or I would learn them at a speed where I would constantly have to start and stop. I'd break and start and break and stop. And you're actually teaching your hands to stop and start and stop and start. And you're like unintentionally teaching your hands the wrong thing. And then maybe you finally get through it, but as you get faster, you know, you crumble. Like you're not even able to get within, you know, 80% of the, the performance tempo, right? So the key is to spend more time up front, learn it correctly, and then speeding it up will be very easy down the, front, the fact. Okay, uh, learn under tempo, use a metronome. Okay, use a metronome. This goes without saying, I know some of us are not practicing with the metronome. I know, you know, I know, we all know, right? And you just gotta do it. There's no reason for you to not be practicing with your metronome. I mean, literally every excuse, you know, you know, Mr. Dick has been on my mind a lot because I heard that he's retiring this year. He used to say this all the time. Uh, excuses are, and I've heard both. Like he used to say armpits and he used to say feet. But excuse everyone, uh, excuses are like armpits. Everyone's got two of them and they both stink, right? So your excuses for you can't find your metronome or there aren't any batteries inside of them, those stink. Just get your metronome and do the work. <laughs> you have to do it so that you know that you're, you're practicing correctly, okay? So we turn the metronome on. This is quarter note equals, data quarter equals 56. You may go faster, you may go slower, but as you're practicing, you need to practice. And don't be afraid to go slower if you're learning this, okay? So uh, this excerpt sounds like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so for this, this takes us to our next part, which is mark your music. As you're looking at this, okay, let me, let me pull this over here for a second. Um, a lot of times I'll, I'll give music to my students, you know, and I try to have them order the books as much as possible. So it's super important that you have the originals to the music that you're learning. You know, sometimes you'll have to make a photocopy just for speed sake or like you're, you need it like right then. But as a musician, you wanna start building your own personal library of the music that you're performing. So, you know, that you can mark them. I know that when I was a student, I would see my, my, my teacher's books and you can just see the years of, of practicing, teaching and, and use that those books have made through and it's a part of that history with the music. Um, I find the same thing for all the music that I play and I have my students play a lot. I, I really encourage my students to buy the music if they can. And then, you know, you write your name on the inside cover. So, you know, property of Hui Yu and Pan. And then you see those copies of music. And then when they borrow it from me, I say, hey, make sure I get this back. And then you have to write their name down because otherwise, uh, if they don't remember to give back to you, you gotta remember to follow up with them. But anyway, uh, you should write in your book. Um, if you get a clean piece of music uh, and it comes back the following week in your private lesson and there are no marks in your music, I say, hey, where's the work? You know, just like math, you gotta show your work. And part of, uh, I didn't learn this until later, but part of learning music is making little discoveries along the way. Discoveries of things that you wanna remember, uh, notes to yourself, uh, finding the phrases. There, there's a couple things. At a base level, it's just like figuring out where the beats are, right? So you know that this is beat um, one, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, right? And those are the big beats. Uh, I've had some friends who just make like lines where the big beats are. So now they know where the subdivisions are, and this is two and three, so this is uh, bump uh, in the second measure. If this is four, and you know that's on beat five. One, two, and three. And I do this with all the beginners too. Oh, sorry. With beginners, they have to know where all the counts are, right? Four and five, six and one. One and two and three, four, five, six. Okay, in this section that we're here, we're on the second line now. You might need to figure this out, right? So that's an eighth note. One, there's six eighth notes per bar because we're in six eight. One, two, it's a quarter note, so it's worth two eighth notes. One, two, three, and this is another quarter note. Four, five, six. Okay, so you say, okay, I figured that out. So I don't play on five, I don't play on three. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? And then uh, in a broader scheme, let me erase all this, right? In a broader scheme, what I see here is that this is one long phrase, this first line. 
Bazam pegedam pam pu yam tegedam tegedam dege 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 dam bzzz jump pam pam pum pim pam pum pim pam pum pam pam right and then down here we have two smaller phrases right because this phrase and this phrase are the same dum pram 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 and then do do ti ta ta um pram 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 and then the reverse pra pa pra 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 right so now you've you've memorized it because you took a second to analyze what's going on. You've got the A theme here, and then you've got the B and the C, or B prime, right? So this would be like A, sorry, let me go back out. We won't, we, we're gonna play here in just a second, so st stick with me. This is A, this is B, and this is A, and this is B prime. It's a little bit different. It's like the reverse of the second one, right? So without looking at it now, I've already memorized the second line. I know it's, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Mm, bum, da, bum, da, bum, mm, bum. Sorry, I'll put another beat. Bum, da, bum, da, bum, crescendo. Bum, 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 bum. Opposite. Bum, mm, bum, 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 bum. Right. So that's a way of memorizing music. I get lots of questions about how do you memorize music, and this analyzing process. You know, you've got to give your your brain a framework to start plugging these things in, so you can make sense of it all. Right, um, I remember in ninth grade we read a tale of two cities. The best of times it was the worst of times, right? And we had to memorize that opening paragraph. It was horrible because like I was just sitting there reading it, and, like like trying to drill it over and over and over again. And my older brother said something. He's like, "Do you know what all these words mean? Like, do you know what incredulity means? <laughs> you should know what you're saying, and it'll make more sense as you're reading. Because you also know." It's they're opposites of each other, right? So if you can remember one, it might help cue you to remember what the other of the is. Same thing here. If you can create some structure in your mind of what it is that you're playing, and it makes sense to you, then you're less likely to have a memory slip, and you'll learn it correctly the first time. Okay. All right. We that was tip number six. Uh, number seven I already did, which is to sing the part. Take it again. I mentioned this earlier. You want to sing it with the inflection, with the dynamics, <clears throat> with the style and the phrasing of what you're ultimately going to try to express with your instrument. And this goes for uh, percussionists, but you know you see wind players and brass players do this all the time. Percussionists, I find that we don't do this enough because you're like, oh, well, I don't sing. It's like, dude, come on. If you're a musician, you've got to sing so that you can express the music. And then the the less friction there is between what you're singing and making your hands just do what you're singing or hearing in your head, the better off you're going to be. And then we just talked about strategy number eight, which is to analyze and identify um, the music. Okay, now it's eight. It's got like a part two to it, which we're going to go to here in the next second. So let me ask if there are any questions first, and then we're going to move into this this next excerpt down below. Okay, I, I heard something pop up. Uh, hey, Christian, how's it going? Saludos. Welcome, and thanks for coming into the room, Christian. And I think I see a question here. What piece are we looking at? Mike Wozniak drums. Hey, Mike. Uh, we were just looking at uh, Portraits and Rhythm, A2 number four, and now we're moving into like the second half of the lesson, which is gonna be uh, about virtual drum and bugle core, and we're gonna be looking at both the A-class audition piece and the world-class audition piece. We're just gonna look at a little snippet of both. I'm gonna throw these last three, three or four strategies to you. And again, if you wanna see the music as we're doing this, uh, all the overlays, you can come on to uh, Facebook and YouTube. The stream is happening over there as well. Okay? All right. Oh, and then Instagram, thanks for those hearts, guys. Likes, and you can see on Facebook and YouTube, those little likes and hearts coming up over here. So thanks as you, as you guys are tapping those. I can see those coming up periodically. Um, okay, let's look at this next one. So uh, we're looking at the A-class audition etude. And, and this is important because if you can uh, incorporate these strategies earlier, than later, sooner than later in your you know, education as a musician. When you get to this world-class audition, like I had a sp specifically a student who got the music this weekend. He was going to audition for world-class. He's like, I don't even know where to start with this thing. Like, I haven't even seen half the, I don't even know what that means. It's going by way too fast. I don't know how I'm gonna learn this part. So we said, okay, well, let's look at the A-class audition etude also. And basically, the strategies that you would use to learn the A-class audition A2 are the same strategies that you would use for the world-class audition A2, okay? So we're looking at it. I'm doing a scan. I'm getting 170, so just so I can get an idea of what it's going to sound like 
uh, I probably would not play through it at 170 because a lot of times this drumline drum core music is like way faster at performance tempo than what you would actually be able to learn in that even close. So I would just play through it very, very slowly. But just so I have an idea of where I'm headed. Okay, so that's where we're headed, right? And then the next step is to start playing through it. So I'm gonna play through this very slowly. I'm gonna pick a tempo to where I don't need to stop. That's the, that's the key. I'm gonna pick a tempo where I don't need to stop or I'm gonna do my best not to stop. Slower than you think, probably. And you're gonna start thinking ahead to, uh, let's just talk about strategy eight first, which is to analyze and identify exercises. So similar to in the beginning, we talked about like, okay, what is this? What am I familiar with? What am I unfamiliar with? There are certain things when I scan this, I'm going like, okay, that's an exercise I'm gonna to need to practice. So in the first, let's play through it once and then we'll um, break it down, okay? So if I were sight reading this, and let's, I'm gonna put myself in the shoes of a, like a high school student, okay? So I would start at a tempo where I don't need to stop. What does that mean? Okay, so mezzo forte, jung, dun, jung, dun, dun, jung, piano, Okay, now if you do that with me, you only have one chance to sight read it because if I play it again for a second time now, I'm not sight reading anymore. I'm practicing at this point, right? So uh, I, I personally love sight reading. Like one of my favorite things to do in a large ensemble setting is the first read, you know, like the first rehearsal and you just downbeat and you play through the pieces if it's the performance because you only get one shot to, to perform that way. And, you know, that's the way they do it uh, in film scores, you know, film scoring sessions. You get one shot, you are typically sight reading also. You're not getting the music for you, like whatever pops up on the sand, you just boom, play it. And it's got to sound like the final product the first time through. So it's like a fun game you can play with yourself. And eventually you get to the point where your sight reading ability level is above most things that you get. And so that, you know, you're just able to play stuff right out of the gate. Sometimes you'll still get stuff like in this world-class piece, there are some things I was like, wait, what is that? And you have to break it down, which is also an important skill set that we're gonna talk about here in a second. Okay, so tip number eight, which is analyze the exercise, identify the exercises that you're gonna need to work on, right? So in this instance, you have dun, 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 okay? So you've got this right hand flam to left hand flam, and with beginners I'd be like, okay, you see how your flams are up here, your grace notes are up here, and everything looks the same? You've gotta get that down, right? So let's just get that accent pattern down, and then there's probably some sort of flam accent breakdown that we need to be practicing. Right? And then once you figure out this skill set, right, basically you'll get to the point where you can add flames to any accent pattern that you see. Right? So I would make up an exercise for myself to work that pattern. I would do like Something where there's a flam and there's no flam, there's a flam, there's no flam. And I'm making sure that the structure is not changing because I'm adding the flam. Grace notes stay down, clear two height separation between my accents and my inner beats. Okay, all right, next line. Okay, so this is important that you're programming your hands. If you're at piano, it's basically just a progression up the forte, that last notes. So I add an extra drag there. So as I'm playing this, I'm partly like Terminator style trying to scan the music and imprint it in my brain as I'm playing it. I'm not doing what I did in high school, which is just mindlessly looping it over and over again and just hoping that the music sticks to my brain, right? You've got to say like, okay, it's a right flam, two right flams, it's two left flams, the right flams are on the downbeat, the left flams are on the upbeats, and then it's like tap, tap, roll, da, da, on four and, it's crescendo, the release is at forte, the first downbeat of measure two is piano, right? I'm being as vivid as I can in the like articulation of what it is. It's not just like, I'm hoping it sticks in my hands that I'm playing, right? So, oh, it's mezzo forte in the beginning, I forgot to mention that. So it's mezzo forte, so I'm not looking at the music anymore, and I haven't practiced this excerpt 
So you're kind of seeing me digest it live right now. So it's mezzo forte, jung, jung, mm, piano, right there, du, 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 bum, bum, forte on that last release. We're going slow and you're programming these heights into your brain and your hands now. Because guess what? When, when you go fast, when we hit 170, you're not gonna have time to think about any of this. Your hands just need to know these anchor points and kind of where you're going and what the overall like shape of the music that you're playing is. Because in the next example that we need to get to here very quickly, the music is going by so fast and it's so dense that you have to program this stuff into your hands at the slower tempo. The rhythms have to be you know, immaculate. The sound quality is gonna be there. The flow, all that has to happen with each stair step. If you get to 200 and you look like you're working to death to play the part, it's because somewhere between the tempo that you learned it and 200, you started getting tense and you went too fast too soon and that's why you're stressing. Okay, all right, so uh, the next part, do take it pop pop, put it at the end, so I know it's syncopation. Okay, and then, so that's a, a left accented roll. So if you've ever practiced accent and roll, where did I learn those? I learned those when I was gridding five stroke rolls through a triplet grid. All right, it's figuring out how to get two notes without crushing down that second note. If you've worked that before, then then you don't need to work that, all right? Or, or maybe you'll just touch on that within the exercise. But if you've never learned that piece of vocabulary before and you're seeing it for the first time, you'd be like, oh, I'm crushing that 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 double. How do I? You might have to work through that, right? So again, you're marking your music and you're saying, okay, what are the things that I know how to do, all right? Jugga, jugga, da, jugga, jugga, da. Okay, I need to practice those flams because my teacher tells me that I always uh, pop my left flam, so I'm gonna work those, right? Um, I'm, I'm role playing here, right? Um, although I do sometimes pop my left flams. I need to work those. And then I remember that the first time it's piano crescendo forte, and the second time it's mezzo piano crescendo forte, right? So you're just making notes to yourself as you're playing this. So that when you come and practice the next day, you're not having to start over and go like, oh, what am I working on again? Um, and this is the main thing that you need to remember, and I want to say it now so I don't forget at the end of the lesson, which is when you finish practicing at the end of the day, you should already know, or you should take a moment but at the very end of your practice session to write some notes down for yourself on what you're gonna practice the next day or your next practice session. So that when you start practicing the next practice session, you're not going, oh, uh, what do I need to work on today? Um, and then you just like do that thing where you kind of play through stuff and then figure out what you need to be working on. That's a waste of time. So while it's fresh in your mind, you're saying like, oh, those left lands were not good today. And um, I can't play that five-lit section, which is what we're gonna look at next. I can't play that five-lit section. I need to keep shedding on that tomorrow, okay? Uh, I haven't seen any questions come through. Uh, Kevin, how's it going? Gabriel Nunez, oh, thanks for tagging people, Kevin, appreciate that. Um, so if, if you know what you're gonna um, be struggling with, and this is kind of the next bit, we're only gonna look at, we don't have time to look at one section of this piece, right? But um, I just started looking at this this afternoon. So I'm gonna do all the things that we talked about. It's, it's 200. There's no way that you're gonna be able to sight read. Uh, maybe I would not be able to sight read this at 200. Yeah, I can't sight read that 200, right? So. Um, the stickings are going by so fast that you want to just make sure that you're learning it correctly. And you wouldn't want to learn it at 200 because you're going to miss heights, you're going to miss all those details, those nuances, that if you miss programming to your hands in the beginning, oh, you know, God help you. Because <laughs> you're going to have to relearn it. And relearning it or, or trying to change something that you learned incorrectly is way harder than just learning it correctly in the beginning, right? I need to get this quote down because I think of it all the time. Whoa, Amber Alert. Conquer screen, what is that? Bomb squad detail, oh my god, that's not good. It's got a bomb squad alert. 
Congress Springs? I don't even know where that is. Uh, okay. Um, hi, guys. Hi, hi, hi. Okay, that's a good tip. Great. I'm glad that helped. Um, okay, so where was I? Relearning things incorrectly. Oh, that quote, it's like, uh, give me six hours to chop down the tree. I'll spend the first five sharpening it. So that what I equate that I don't know if that's exactly that's that's the gist of the quote. I should find out. Is it is it uh, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington? It's a president. <laughs> like so you said about what I can remember about. But anyway, the idea is that a lot of times, and this is what I thought when I was younger, which is like, oh, I don't have a lot of time. I need to learn it faster. So I need to go faster, 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 faster. And you're just causing more problems for yourself. It's better to invest more time up front. Applying it slowly, learning it correctly. Like, if you have, let's say, a hundred percent of a pie of your time that you can spend learning this piece, I would say spend sixty, maybe even seventy percent of it, learning it slowly. Right? Like you're just learning it and making it as musical and expressive and beautiful and touch-oriented as you can. And then, is it until you know, like the last thirty, forty percent of the time, you're you know, starting to speed things up. And the, the speed of process should be very, you know, easy if you're doing it gradually over time. But spend more time slower. It, it just works. It works, okay? All right. It's hard, though, because you have to force yourself to practice with the metronome and, and force yourself to play slowly. All right, so I'm going to learn this now in front of everybody, which, you know, for the... For fear of embarrassing myself, I hope I can read this. But okay, so I'm gonna learn. So dum dum, da 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 dum, ah. And notice that I'm not play, putting in a sort of rhythm. I'm just reading through the sticking, right? It's a chord note triplet. So bum 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 boom ba, ah, bim bum do do boom ga. So I sing it first, so I know what it's supposed to sound like. Okay, and that left hand is what's up, and there's a tenuto in that right hand release. So, so I'm gonna play that right just a little bit higher. If I'm at an inner beat height here, I'm gonna come just a little bit. So it's like, uh, it's on its way to that shot. And there's gonna be a lift on that, right? Okay, next bar, mezzo piano, uh, still in the center. So mezzo piano inner beats, there's an accent. So I'm basically gonna play these at a piano inner beat height. Okay, so what are these? What rudiment? That's like a. It's not a choo choo. Okay, it's a paradiddle sticking. Oh, it's like a book report without the downbeat drags. So, book reports are. Right? So, this is where it's important where if you have a well of vocabulary to draw from, then when you're learning new music, you're going to like, oh, that's like this thing, and that's like this thing. And that's part of you know, why you get better at sight reading the more you do it. When you read books, you're not having to sound out the word cat and dog every time you see it because you've seen those words enough times where you just see it and you're like, oh, that's cat, that's dog, right? And that's fox, which is kind of like, is it a cat? Is it a dog? Oh, it's like a wolf, right? And they're like, I know what wolves are. Wolves are kind of like uh, coyotes, right? And you've got these relationships that you're drawing. So it's a paradiddle sticking. It's like a book report without the drags. And it's triplet bass. And then you come in on the downbeat. So, and that's not the end of the phrase though. Forte release right there. So, okay. So, in my mind, I need to plant a flag on that forte. That's forte. That's a. That's not quite the arrival point though. I feel like the arrival point is. To be seen, right? Because I'm still kind of like analyzing as I'm learning this. So it sounds like shot, shot is the is the peak of the phrase here, right? Um, so I have. So here, okay, this is where you're about to make a mistake, okay? If uh, the younger version of Huey would make a mistake, which is like I've played it through three, four times now, and now I'm going to want to go faster. I'm going to want to go, which I. Can do, I was about to say could do, but can do because I just did it. <laughs> but don't do that because what's going to happen is all that 
that good work you did is going to start to deteriorate and degrade the more of those that you do, right? It's better to spend just, you know, 10 more reps at that slower tempo and you're ingraining all those heights in the flow and the hand to hand timing, this, the way your hands are moving between the spaces, you're ingraining all those good habits that you want to show up later when we go fast at this slower tempo, okay? So, boom, mm, mm, bo, dun, 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 da, da, cha, cha, uh, forte, pop, pop, and then let me just add the next part. Da, da, para, diddle, diddle, da, dun, dun, da, da, da. Okay, all right, so this is a good note to mention here. So, this is where that analyzing piece comes into play. So even though, I'll show you guys what I'm looking at here. Even though these 16th notes are all like strung together, let me just zoom in here, right? Even though these are all strung together, that's not like the phrase. There's another phrase that starts here. shot, right? So there's actually, I mean, you want to think over the bar line, but that's a new piece of vocabulary right there. So what do you have here? Paradiddle diddle. Oh, I know what that is. Paradiddle diddle. And it starts with a drag here. Okay? So in my mind, I'm thinking, dig a paradiddle diddle. Dig a paradiddle diddle. Dig a dun dun, dig a dun dun, dig a dig a dun dun, ga. Right? So it's two things that I then connect together to make a longer phrase. And on those it's a mezzo, a forte, back down to piano, fortissimo. So a mezzo forte, forte, fortissimo, fortissimo shot, which is probably like fortissimo plus a little bit of extra, and then you get to this five lit bit, which is what we're gonna work on. Okay, I said I wasn't gonna break down this opening section, but I kind of did it already. Um, and we are blowing into this lesson. So let me just play this first part one more time for my own sake. Okay, so stay down. Those are all downstrokes. That's a left, that's a downstroke in the left hand. Okay, got that part. Next part. Okay, so at this tempo, and I would say okay, if it's marked at 200, you should not have any qualms about going 100. Oh, which is what I'm doing. Oh, that's a little bit slower. Because here's the thing, if you can play this entire it's like a, it's probably, I don't know, six, seven, or eight, eight lines, this, this audition excerpt. These are just the first two lines. Um, if you can play the whole thing through without stopping at 100 with great sound quality, beautiful flow, accents, inner beats, the right stickings, and you look and feel confident and your hands are not freaking out, then you just keep doing that, right? And you clean it, you clean it, and then once it's really, really, really good, and you're like, I got this. At that point, there's probably a good chance that you already have chunks of it memorized. And then as you gradually slow up, or speed up, gradually over time, I don't mean just like in one practice session, maybe like today it's 100, tomorrow it's 108, 116, like we've got a month, these videos aren't due until June. You, if you sped up like eight beats over the next 25 days, you're gonna hit your 200 mark very easily, right? So again, I just, I can't stress this enough, and this is just as much a reminder for my my former self as it is for, for my students and anyone else who might be watching. Or maybe your teachers told you this and you didn't believe them and now you're hearing it from someone else and you're like, oh, that's what he was talking about. You just gotta practice slower. Practice slower uh, and, and, and instill all those correct habits that you wanna show up in your performance later at the faster tempo. Because if it's not happening at the slow tempo, it's definitely, Definitely not going to happen at the faster tempo. Okay. All right. Any questions? Man, I feel like I'm just rambling here. And we're going to be chopping this up for some other stuff later, but no questions. Mike says, this is great. 
Thanks, Mike. Thanks for letting me know that this is helping. Okay, so we're gonna spend, maybe we should just do another lesson on this. I might just wrap here. What today's lesson was gonna be about, and I think that's what I'm gonna do, because this next part is gonna take a little bit of time. But I'll give you kind of the, the, the preview. On next week's episode, actually this is the this is the final tenth and final episode of season four. So I, I have an idea for another video series called How I Learned This Lick. And it's basically this, where I find music that I'm working on and I just share with you guys how I learn it. And it hopefully it you know <laughs> it sounds so boring. But I know for, for me at least, I like hearing this kind of stuff about uh, other people, how they approach learning things, kind of the process that they go through, and then I, I pick up little nuggets here and there and I incorporate them into my own practice. Um, but I think what it would be is like me filming some some of these like teaching videos on how to learn something like this, and then cutting them up into chunks so that people could digest them in those those chunks as you're playing through them. But if that's something that you'd be interested in doing, maybe people can send me licks that they're having trouble with, like you have, you have music that you're working on, you have your Allstate music that you're working on, like, I don't know how to learn these two bars. And then I do an, an episode of how I learned this lick, uh, and it's about something that you send in to me. If that's something that you're interested, send me a direct message, let me know. Uh, leave something down below in the comments, and uh, maybe we'll make a series about that, okay? All right, so really briefly, I see questions coming in. Owen says, hey, what's up, Owen? I have sort of general question on a certain thing I see often, but I can never really play well. It's whenever I see a flam, on a diddle, either starting a roll or just on its own. Yeah, Owen, oh, so we call those, typically call those cheeses or Charles or flam stutters or flam fives. Um, let me answer that for you after I do this little five lit bit, but I would also recommend that you check out the Percussive Art Society, um, like Facebook or YouTube. There was a Fundamentals Friday presentation just this past Friday by Roger Carter, and he did breakdowns for that rudiment that you're looking at right now. And the, the lesson he did does not get much better than what he did. So I would reference that first, but let me show you some stuff right after we do this five lip bit also. Okay, so Owen, check that out. I find like sometimes, if you guys have seen Wreck-It Ralph, it's one of the movies that we have on rotation in the house with the kiddos, but there's a guy who's like the information desk and people ask him questions when they make it to the internet. And uh, sometimes I feel like that guy, you know, Owen asks me a question, I just say like, go that way and, and watch this video, so, okay. This five-lit section, which very slowly, okay, there's a whole lesson that we could do on just this five-lit section. Um, that lick from O2 that I always play, the Cavalier snare break from O2, um, that cadenza like section was five lits. And this was a pain in the butt to clean that summer because everyone's interpretation of the five was a little bit different. When you've got these like hertas and these drags, sometimes they get a little bit slurred and open, things get weird, right? There's a way to practice this section very, very specifically. And the first step to that is just to know the skeleton sticking. So uh, in this section down here, these three stickings, and again, this handout is a free download on my, download on my website, huayuanpan.com slash free lessons, linked in my Instagram, linked in all the videos down below. You can download this handout, but those three stickings are all the stickings in this. So this first sticking, right, left, right, right, left, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. That's the sticking for this one, one, two, three, four, five, and this one, one, two, three, four, five, okay? The next sticking, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, which is the same two, three grouping. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. That sticking is here. One, two, one, two, three. And then this third sticking here, which there's no accent on the downbeat. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. That's the underlying sticking for this hair to, oop, did I not change color? <clears throat> for that pattern and that pattern. So if you practice these three stickings, which you need to be able to play like butter, right? And I've got two breakdowns on how you can go about practicing that down below here. 
right? But you have to be able to play these three stickings like butter before you even start to start hacking your way through that five lens section. Because I can tell you at 200, it's going by so fast, it's so dense that if there's any sort of tension or weirdness in your hands, uh, it's gonna show up in that section, okay? All right, Instagram, we're about to end. I wanna say real quick, thanks for watching. Um, and we'll see you guys in the next video. Have a good weekend, guys. Bye. All right, YouTube and Facebook, we're going to keep going for just a couple more minutes. Uh, if you do have any open questions or Q&As, uh, we can do that here at the end. I right, percussion says, Kaboom! Cobham was a, uh, I don't, that, that was definitely not the part. I was just making stuff up. But Cobham was the uh, street beat that we played in Cavi's 02? 03? One of those years, written by Jim Bailey. And the count off, uh, the first measure is, and that shot's on the uh, a four. So one, all right, let's see if I can do it. Sorry, I'm. Derail it, ADD teacher. Right. Um, and then Mouse, Jason Payne, would tap off with, I don't even know how he played the open on the lick, because he'd have to go a one. But he would tap off with that opening lick. So he would go. And then I'm gonna go bucka burr, bucka burr, gaka burr, ga bucka burr, bucka burr, bucka burr, ga. There you go. Alright. O2, I think. Dre, I think that was O2. That sounds right. Dylan Snyder says, Evan Bundy. Oh, thanks for tagging uh, Evan Dylan. Uh, Mike Wozniak says, This is great. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. Okay, so let me just play these two, these two variations real quick uh, so you get a feel for them. We're at this. Um, Oh man, this is this is this would be such a cool lesson. We're running out of time, but let me just show you guys what I kind of figured out. No, uh, what is going on? Okay, this thing. Can you guys see this? Okay, this is what I was playing around with earlier. This I feel like this is an Instagram post waiting to happen. Maybe I should just make this theme. Okay. First sticking. Check. Next sticking. Next sticking. Check. Sticking. Who would not would not want to practice your five lets with that, right? And then there's all these things that you would start layering in, right? So that's your skeleton. You can play all those stickings. And then, for example, that second sticking, right? You have or the third sticking. You have the herta. Sticking. Diddle. Ah. Right? And this is 300 at 5 lit. So I'll give you an example. If the show tempo is at, let me exit out of this for a second. If the show tempo is at 200 and you're practicing at 100, okay, so the chord note's at 100, and you've got to play 5 lits at uh, 100. Um, oh, but the five lit is like, it's five over two quarter notes. So if your practice tempo is 100, then the half note, which is the space of the five lit, is 50. I think I lost some of you there, but just bear with me. 50 is the space of the five lit. And then there's five notes happening in that space of 50. So five times 50 is 250. If your practice tempo is 60, which means the show tempo is at 120 now, 60 times 5 is 300, which is what we're at now. This is 300. 
where did it go? 300, right? So now we're practicing at a show tempo of 120. I know I lost some of you guys in all that math gibberish that I shouted out at you, but let me see if I can do this. Um, I'm still learning how to use this, bear with me. I, should, I thought I was, should be able to pull this out. Go like this. And then I thought I did it earlier, hold on. And then you do it with a pencil. I need to push and hold. No, well, there was a way to have it show up at the same time. Come on. No. I can pull the music up over here. Okay, let me, let me model some of the things I'm actually talking about here, which is one of the things that I'm noticing, let me get rid of all this stuff, is that even though it's like a string of fives, what I see is I see a phrase here, and then I see a longer phrase here. So it's actually two phrases. And the first phrase is the... Forte release. Okay, that's one arrival point. And then the next arrival point is. So all together. Okay, and so maybe your win for today is that you can play the part. You know, just for kicks, I might try like. Okay, and, and quick tip, if you were practicing this, you wouldn't go from 300 to 350. You'd probably go like 300 to 320, right? If you were to go in a, in a four beat increment or an eight beat increment, then you go up by like 20 clicks, right? Um, Take a time. Okay, and then just one more for fun. Like that wasn't stressing my hands out or my brain out, but you could hear like maybe some of the rhythms weren't getting quite as perfect uh, as they were at 300, right? So that tends to compound over time. So if you spend more time at the slower tempo, which is what I would do if I was actually practicing, then when you go faster, you won't have weirdness start to creep into your playing.
Okay, right? Like, and that would be my practice session for today. I wouldn't feel the need to get to 200. I'm just getting my hands comfortable. And I'm just reading right now. Like I read through, I'm like, okay, I, I know what it is now. Right? My hands can play it. It's not show tempo, but I'm starting to introduce my, and here's the magic part. You do this today and you go to sleep tonight. And when you wake up tomorrow and you practice it again, at 300 or 400, it took me, what, like 20 minutes to get to this point. But I wouldn't start at 400. I would go back to where I started, which was 300. Start where you, from the beginning, right? And then instead of taking 20 minutes for me to get to 400, it might only take me 10 minutes or maybe even five minutes. And I'll actually even be able to do it better than I did it today, right? And that's how you practice. You have to start over from the beginning every day, but it just takes you less time to get to where you left off and then you can go further. And then if you don't take, if you take days off, and that's where things get rusty, right? So I feel, I find that when you're learning things, you don't wanna lose that momentum. Once you kind of get your brain in that flow of like, okay, this is how it works. Um, the worst thing you can do is to have to relearn things that you've already learned before because you forgot it, because you took time off from practicing. That's always like a, like, oh, I'm wasting my time because I've already done this before, you know? So um, there's a question, and then I think we're gonna wrap tonight. Today's, you know, it's the 10th, 10th lesson, so we went a little bit extra, but um, and then if there are any questions, any open Q&A questions, this would be the time to ask them. Okay. Um, oh, Dre says it had the heart to fivelet stuff. I don't remember that at all. Um, what med app is this? This is, um, I should know what it's called. It's called, uh, I don't know what this is called. It's called, TE Tuner, I think. I use this. I use this app every day when I was teaching because if you're a, if you're teaching band, the tuner is key. <laughs> I definitely cannot do with whistling, but uh, a smiley face lights up, which the kids love. Come on, I can I can light it up. I think by playing the note. I mean, middle school, high school kids go crazy over that. I get crazy over that when I would practice trumpet and clarinet with that, right? But I find that you can program, like, if we're doing five lets here, you can do this. I mean, and this is new. Like, when I, I, I used this before they had any of these features, but they've updated quite a bit since then. They've got the dial mode setting. I mean, it's one of the metronomes. I'm like a kind of like a, a metronome crazy person. I, I love collecting metronomes. Um, I would still say this is like my go-to when I'm practicing. Um, I find that the Dr. Beats tend to die too quickly with the 9 volts. These things can go forever on a single 9 volt. And then like, you know, if I'm teaching, I might use my phone or an iPad. But you can beat this thing up and not have to worry about, you know, destroying your phone or your iPad. The cool thing about this though, and in this instance it's super important, is that there's like a rock beat behind it. So it's... Um, you know, there's more groove and more feel than just like beep, 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 beep all the time. So uh, Mike says, so you learn these five stickings before trying them against a quarter note pulse. Yeah, great point, Mike. Um, that's what I would do. I would just play the, the grouping and be able to play it evenly like a stick control. Just like you would like a paradiddle. Like you don't have to stick a paradiddle with a metronome right out of the gate. Right, I, when I first started teaching, I'd be like, hey students, this is a paradiddle. And I would have the metronome clicking, even though they were just working the sticking. Um, the, the student is not thinking about the metronome, right? Because they're concentrating on that new sticking. The same way that you would be in this fivelet if you're not familiar with it, right? One, two, three, four, five, one, two. And you can use the metronome, right? But that's not the priority. The priority is you've got Good flow, good sound, all the notes are evenly spaced. You understand your hand's doing this in the right. And I'm placing those two doubles in the left. And then I kind of get to a tempo. Right, there you go.
So I'm using the metronome to facilitate my practice and I'm not trying to cram myself into this metronome constraint that we have. It's like, you gotta do it. The metronome is there to assist you, not to make your life harder. So, good question, Mike. All right, man, today, it's too much talking, I think. It's all good information, I think. It's all stuff that I wish I could tell my students in a private lesson, but private lessons don't last this long, so. Um, all right, guys, uh, real quick, I just wanna say, if you're still watching right, thank you so much. If you're catching this replay after the fact, awesome. You know, I, I know these kind of go on. Sometimes these longer interview things, I, I know for sure I don't have time to watch this thing of the day, so um, I know if you're watching them in little bits and pieces, uh, or maybe you're watching this at night before you can fall asleep, uh, so that you have something to fall asleep to. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, it's been really fun doing season four of these live streaming lessons. I've got a couple other projects that are happening in the mix right now. We're doing these, uh, we're building out these institutional accounts for Drumline Chops, which is taking quite a bit of time, uh, but also filming a bunch of lessons. I'm, I have not worked on my left-hand traditional course uh, as much as I would like in the last week, but I'm gonna probably knock that out next week. So it is in its beta launch right now, if you saw that at the beginning of, of today's live stream. Um, you can go to drumlineblueprint.com slash courses for left-hand traditional pro if you, are taking these next couple months to learn how to play left-hand traditional. You're a tenor player, you want to learn how to play left-hand traditional, you're a pit player, you're a teacher that wants to be able to teach students how to do left-hand traditional. Maybe you already know how to play, but you just want to know how another teacher sets it up. I'm going to be doing a special uh, session of, of like a live stream session with those left-hand traditional pro beta members. So if that's something that you're interested in, also you could check that out and, and, and join that group. And then once that's finished and packaged up, then we'll launch that uh, at large to everybody uh, um, that might be interested in that. So that's one thing. And then um, there's probably more. I should have written it down, but I'm so tired at this point. It's so late. And uh, I'm just going to wrap it here. So thanks, guys. Thanks for season four. It's been fun watching. If you have any questions or if I can help, send me a direct message. Let me know. And um, like, subscribe, follow, share. Share this out with all your friends on social media. Uh, download the handout, freelessons.com. There's a bunch of other free lessons there from the past three seasons that you can check out as well. So um, let me know if you have any questions or if I can help. Please stay safe. And um, yeah, have a good week, guys. We'll see you soon. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Christian. See you.